think in order to understand the idea of Newton as entirely autonomous and self-taught, it's necessary to know a great deal more about what the characteristic relationship of the student or the disciple with the professor or tutor or master at this period was. There's an enormous amount of um, pious, no doubt accurate, but nevertheless apologetic biographical and autobiographical reflection produced in the second half of the 1600s in England about how young men learn. Young men of Newton's ilk are supposed to be disciples of their masters. There's a very strong model of, as it were, intellectual ancestry in play. It's no coincidence that, for example, one of the really important books that Newton studies in the early 1660s is Diogenes' Lives of the Philosophers. Because Lives of the Philosophers, especially in the edition that Newton uses, is a model of how philosophy develops, which is about lineages. It's about schools, so, and it's about intellectual inheritance, so that the idea of intellectual inheritance is a standard to which one should live. And I think one needs to remember that if you're thinking about what could Newton's relationship with his Cambridge masters have possibly been. There's a culture of discipleship, which Newton not only, I think, sometimes cultivates with respect to his elders, but also makes extremely sure that his juniors cultivate with respect to him. And that's notorious in Newton's case. In specific terms, Newton is superb at a kind of intellectual bricolage. That's to say, extracting from material he's read, or lectures he's heard, or essays on which he takes notes, precisely the set of tools and techniques he needs for the purpose at hand. And these tools tend to be transferred in fascinating and innovative ways. So that, for example, in the early 1660s, Newton was clearly studying the works on algebra of John Wallace, the um, Presbyterian divine Oxford mathematician, um, and using Wallace's ideas of infinitesimals and indivisibles to build a model of algebraic geometry and a method of analysis, which, although heavily indebted to John Wallace, and in that sense perhaps not original, is nevertheless extremely innovative and moves far beyond the limits of Wallace's model of algebraic geometry and how infinitesimals work. The same is clearly true with respect to the first Lucasian professor, Isaac Barrow, who was surely a patron and supporter of Newton, that seems absolutely clear, and whose geometrical lectures Newton attended, um, and who provided really important resources for Newton's work. Um, but Newton, when he's most intensely in touch with Barrow's work, is, I think, already close to, if not past, the level of Barrow's mathematical sophistication. It's not, therefore, an interesting question to ask how autonomous and independent and self-educated was Newton. The question is, how did he make use of the resources in play in Cambridge and London and elsewhere in the 1660s? And if you ask that question, you can see how original and startling Newton is.